Good day, everyone, and a warm welcome to our system webinar. It's all about the psychology of skills and skills development today. Um, my name is Lizette de Villiers. I'll be the, will be the host this afternoon, and we'll shortly hand to Peter de Villiers, the um, head of research and development at Shadow Match. We thank you for joining. A few administrative announcements before we start. As you all know by now we are recording this session because it becomes part of our library of resources. Those of you that don't know all the recordings are available on the Shadow Match calendar. You can go to shadowmatch.co.za or shadowmatch.com. Just click on the events 2022 tab and you will find all the recordings of previous sessions. So if you go back to a previous month, since January, we've had webinars almost every Monday and Wednesday. You can find the recording of those webinars on the specific day. The coaching webinars are not available. They are only available to people who are registered as coaches on the coaching platform. So if you are interested in getting access to the coaching webinars, please go and register as a coach. You go to shadowmatchcoaching.com. I will post the websites in the chat as soon as Peter starts talking. And if you join as a coach, you will get access to the coaching webinars as well. Um, the, the last bit of administrative arrangements, your microphone is currently in the forced mute setting. It will remain like that for the duration of the, of the presentation. Towards the end of the presentation, I will present the questions that came in the chat during the discussion i will then present the questions to peter and we will then enable the setting for you to unmute your microphone and then you will be welcome to also participate live in a question and answer session i think that's all from my side peter thank you very much over to you thank you lizette and welcome everybody just for those who are new to the uh wednesday live webinars um welcome obviously um <clears throat> shadow match is a system that has different components. Um, it has an engine that, that, that is the base engine of the system. And from this engine, we produce results. Results are being used to do um, different things, uh, recruitment, development, team analysis, and, and, and personal wellness programs. On the personal wellness, we have part of it, the coaching platform. And then obviously we have as part of the entire uh, business engine skills grid. And that is a system that, that captures the skills of people, uh, map the skills, and then present a visual comparison between the skills of top performers and the skills of individuals who would like to do the same job. So just uh, so that we all know what is the purpose of these webinars is to help the users of the systems, the different uh, applications of Shadow Match to uh, have a better understanding of where the thinking comes from and how is the system rooted in the academic and the theoretical and the research world and that is my job so um, my job is to bring all the background in well, not all the background information and research and, and analysis to the to the front but to uh, bring some uh, moments of of research so that everybody using the system has a better understanding of the background of research that we are doing. So what I will do now is I will share the notes so that we are all, we are all on the same uh, sheet in terms of our discussion and we do not lose track of one another in the process of uh, going through the information. The topic for today is the psychology of learning. Um, I am responsible for the research and the development and the overall uh, strategy of development of the system. And what I want to share with you is how do we learn and why is learning such an issue? I think it's one of the biggest issues that we have currently in our world. Uh, and before we go into the issues of learning, just a few scary comments um, that we, we know these things, but sometimes we are just not in a space of freedom to say it to one another uh, in, a, in a very transparent, open and honest way. Not that there is something to hide, but we just sometimes um, don't have it, a clear picture in our minds. In the research, it shows um, pot, the delegates and, and participants in this discussion that some people have a resistance to learning. Um, we don't know why. There is a lot to be said about this, but all over the world, in every country, amongst all people, all the people, younger people, um, gender, 
irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, irrespective of history, there, are, there is a percentage of the population, of in any population, with a resistance to learn. And we don't know what causes this. They, they, they battle to learn. If they are forced to learn to get through the schooling system, they really struggle uh, with the learning content. Um, and, and we can't really determine what the reason behind this is. There are no trends, there are no specific analysis and correlations that can be found. But what we do see is that on the, on the practical level of, of the functional uh, state of affairs in a, in a community, there are people with a resistance to learn. Now, I don't want to push the work that I have done um, because my research was not that big. Uh, I read a lot about this and I try to get behind the research of other people and get into that information. But research can't determine why we have this phenomenon. From my personal reading of many articles and publications and the experience that I have, it seems like a preschool parenting society issue. It seems that this, this sort of resistance that people have to learning is rooted in their development in the preschool phase, in other words, um, newborns up to the age of six, seven years, where there is there's a buildup of resistance towards learning of information. It's the, it's the best that I could find in my own mind that works for me as a, a sort of a clarification of this question. Then the second point that I just want to emphasize is some people learn very slow, but once they've got it, they have extensive knowledge and capabilities on the subject. Um, what we must understand uh, is that people do not learn and remember and, uh, and, and absorb information at an equal pace. Some people learn very slow, but once they got it, they seriously have it. And we can't understand that as well. It seems to be amongst people with a very critical and problem solving mindset or habit or in a paradigm of working. And they want to first understand the composition of information and how it's being brought together before they, they, they absorb the, the, the information as permanent knowledge or long-term knowledge. Now, if they learn slowly and they get on top of it and they are then very capable on the subject, they tend to hold on to that information for a very long period of time. So the duration of memory is long term. If they are slow learners, uh, but, but they get on top of it eventually. Others learn very quickly, but they forget very quickly. This is something that is well documented. They learn quickly, they remember things very quickly and easily, but they forget it as quickly. Um, I'll, I'll show you something that you can do with yourself um, just for the fun of it when we are done with this, with this slide. Some have functional resistance. Functional resistance is something different to resistance to learning. They learn until they decide that they know enough and then learning resistance kicks in. So what happens here is, it's the classic example of a student, they, they study until they think, well, I think I can pass the exam by now, and then they stop. And in learning in general, this happens all the time with a certain percentage of society. People learn up to the point where they have convinced themselves that I know enough now. And then additional learning uh, then hit their resistance, their learning resistance. They pick up resistance against, let's call it overlearning. Now the, 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 the weird one, some people learn, they know, and they can even lecture on the topic, but they can't do it. This is as strange as all the other, other uh, comments that we've made. 
Some people learn, they acquire the information, they write a book on it. They can lecture on the topic. They can present papers on the topic. They are seen as specialists, but they cannot do it. The other day, I had a discussion with somebody and the somebody said to me, she's going to a lecture of the, 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 the head of the Department of Business Development at this university talking about the development and sustainable future of small businesses. I said to the person, how many businesses has the lecturer built? No, none. I said, and you're going to listen to him. Why don't you just read a book? Because you can have all the knowledge. Some people learn and they acquire the knowledge. They are extremely well informed about the topic, but they can't do it. This is another riddle that we can't solve. Why is it that, that knowledge can become, we can become saturated with knowledge without the ability to actually do what we have learned? Now, this is where skills comes into play, but we will discuss this further. Now, uh, what I want you to remember is remember this slide, because there will be questions at the end. Why this? Why this? Why this? I will then refer to the scary comments we made at the beginning. And, and, and the scary comments comes down to the point that some people learn in some specific ways, others in other, that we can, that, that I think we've got, we've, we've got that under control. But some people just don't learn. Some people just don't remember. Some people just don't become competent at something, despite the fact that we have trained them over and over and over. So let's have a look at some of the things that we use, words that we use continuously, um, and, and we, we are not clear on what it means, knowledge. This will be quick. Knowledge is theoretical information facts and it's memory base. It's just knowledge, it's information. Learn as a result of information we receive through our senses. We, we see these things, we hear them, we listen to lectures, we smell them, we taste them, we feel them, we experience them. This is how in, uh, information flows to the brain and the brain tries to remember it and it's memory based but it's pure knowledge you know things skills a physical ability to do something successfully in a smooth and effective manner skills are always a physical thing to know how an airplane flies and to fly and land the thing is two completely different topics you can have the knowledge as an engineer but you might not be able to do the task as a pilot or as whatever uh, it, it might be. You can explain how a bicycle works, but riding a bicycle in the Tour de France on TV is a different ball game. That's a skill. And it's not without knowledge, but that is predominantly a physical skill. Competencies. I don't like this word, just for, the, just for in brackets, for those who are interested about my likes. I don't like this word. I like the word skills. The set of characteristics, this is already gray for me. I don't know what characteristics are, but let's stick to the, the, to the, to the academic description. And abilities, a bit gray for me, that enable and improve the performance of a person in a job. So it's a set of attributes that comes together in a very unique way that makes the person competent in doing a specific job. Um, as with skills, uh, how do we learn skills? We learn skills through physical repetition. There we are. We learn skills through physical repetition competencies. As with skill, uh, we learn it through a process of physical repetition and doing the job over and over and over. We'll get to that later on. Talents. This is a word that I like. Um, it's an extraordinary ability to do something without being taught. This, that is a talent. Please keep in mind that when we talk about smart people and capable people and skilled people and knowledgeable people, we're not talking about somebody with talent. Somebody with talent functions in a completely different league to the rest. I was asked long ago by the CEO of a very big company in South Africa, Peter, how can you help me identify the talent in the business? Now they've got thousands of people employed. And I said to him, I can do it to you right now. 
He said, uh, uh, so how many highly, extremely talented people do I have in the business? I said to him, I have bad news for you. You don't have. He said, but how can you say that? I said, if you had talent in your business, you would have known it. There's no question about it. You don't know what talent is. Go play tennis against Novak Djokovic. Then you see what talent is. Go stand against him on the other side of the net. Go play golf against Rory McIlroy. Go run against these top athletes from Central Africa in a marathon. Then you see what talent is. Try it. These people function on a different level to the normal mortals of the world. They are in a different league. Go and watch uh, uh, on, on YouTube some of the videos of talented young children, five, four, five, three, four, five, six years old with musical instruments. Who taught them? You cannot teach a child by the age of four to play Tchaikovsky on a piano. They, you need 30 years to learn it. And they play it. That's talent. So the talented person was born with this extraordinary ability. Where does it come from? I have no idea. It's been given to them. I don't know how, it's, it's above me, it's beyond my scientific knowledge and research. Talented people are in a different league. Just hold on to that. Habits, these are behavioral patterns, easy, simple, straightforward. That's why I like to work with habits. It's learned through multiple repetition of actions associated with success in order to function optimally in the everyday context of life. Habits are being learned in our everyday behavior. It's the things that we repeat every day in work, play, and life, and in the general context of life. These patterns form in the brain. They become stronger over a period of time, and eventually they take over our behavior if they are strong enough. Intelligence. Again, a word, it's the same as competencies. This, this, is, this is a word that I don't like, but just let's get through it. It's to interpret, collate, integrate, and apply skills and knowledge to successfully solve problems. That's intelligent. Well, that's the definition of intelligence. It's to integrate information and skills in order to solve a problem successfully. So with that, um, dear delegates, let's have a look at a few very interesting scenarios. Skills learning is a primary function of sustainability. Now this, that top sentence, dear delegates, is an extremely loaded um, sentence or an idea. It's the primary function of sustainability. Now what am I, what do we mean with this? If we stop learning and we stop developing our skills, and expanding our knowledge faculties in, the, in, in, in our shared knowledge as a business or in our knowledge as an individual, we become unsustainable in this world. We must understand that all skills have a cognitive and a physical component to it. This combination of skills and knowledge is growing like never before. Let's put it visually. The world is learning. We go to Moss, we go out of space, we do, we do things on a micro level, we understand viruses, we analyze viruses, we find their weak spots, we kill them, we, we build mechanical capabilities, we do research in terms of medicine. The world is a learning community and a very quick learning community. It learns currently the fastest it has ever learned in history. But now what happens is, as an individual or as a business, the collective of a business or as a country, we must follow this trend of the fact that the world is a, is a, is a global learning community. We must try to stay, let's say on a topic, I am an electrician. I must stay on that topic at least 
on the topic where I work and make a living. I must stay on this path of following what is the no most recent findings, technologies, capabilities, etc., in the world of an electrician. This could be anything. It could be in the world of medicine, psychology, mechanical engineering, and we can carry on with this. We must, as a business, as a country, and even as a family, but, but very important as individuals, we must keep on learning and expand our knowledge and skills capabilities. I want to show you what happens if we don't. Let's just have a look at the second scenario. So, so this green line says these people or these individuals, they try to stay in line with development, the, the, the curve of learning in the world. And sometimes we fall a bit behind, but we must try to be, to be in line with it. How do we follow this, 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 this line of growth and increased knowledge, skills, and, and, and? We always push to function beyond what you know and what you can do. You must push to perform outside of your comfort zone of knowledge and skills. This is how you stay in a frame of development and learning and growing. You must, you must push yourself beyond what you know and beyond what you can do and beyond what, what your skills allow you. Let me give you an example. If, we, if, if I'm an athlete and I wanna run a marathon and I start by day one, I can run five kilometers. I need to run 42. If I keep on running five kilometers, where will I end? I will end up being very capable of running five kilometers. I need to tomorrow evening run six. The next evening run seven. And that's how I pro make progress to the point where I can run a marathon. The same with knowledge. If I know a certain amount of things about a topic, I need to ask questions and function beyond my circle of comfort and knowledge. I need to be in a position where I push myself out of my comfort zone of knowledge and skills. I need to do more than what I'm capable of and learn more than what I know today. Because when we stagnate, we fall behind. I wanna show you what happens. When we stagnate, let's say I've been on this learning curve up till there, then I stop learning. I just function within my comfort zone of my skills and my knowledge. What happens very soon, I build up a gap that I cannot catch up with anymore. I build up a gap in the world of work and living spaces and functioning that I just cannot I cannot close the gap. Let me give you an example. At the age of 55, person I stopped learning about computers and cell phones and technology. And then five years later, the banks have some of their functions only on the internet. This person has stopped there. And now the bank or the industry, or the hospital, or whatever must happen, has now developed to a point of there. And now I have a gap that I, I can't close this gap. And what then happened is people give up. They just, they just give up. So the sustainability of my independence are being threatened if I stop learning. But this can happen with a school or a university. It can happen with a business. This is the most dangerous thing that can happen to a business. If a business, if the collective intelligence of a business reaches a point and say, ah, we are, we're doing, we're doing okay. We're doing well. We pay all the bills. We don't need to stay on top of our industry into the future. What then happens is we stagnate, we fall behind, and eventually it's not a sustainable situation. The same with a country. 
A country can fall behind because of stagnation of their learning institutions. And at a point, they are so far behind in the world of knowledge, skills, and, 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 and scientific intelligence that they can't catch up with the world anymore. And then it becomes an econo economic disaster. <clears throat> this happens when we function within our boundaries of knowledge and skills. So when we, the moment when we are comfortable and say that we, we remain our functional space where we are comfortable, we actually fall behind because the world doesn't wait and doesn't stagnate with us. But this is the bad one. This is the, this is the, this is the bad one. This happens when we never push ourselves. What happens here is during school, the school phase, for instance, up to high school, there at the very beginning of the graph on the left bottom end, the person was forced to complete school and sort of stay with the learning process of the world. And then thereafter, this happens. They had to learn, do a, do a course here at work, do a little bit of learning there, and then a little bit of learning there. And eventually, eventually they become, they, they become unemployable. Because the world wants these people. And now I'm here and I cannot understand why I can't find a job, build a business, sustain my lifestyle. So this is critical and it can happen when we try to get away with minimal effort, minimal learning, doing as little as possible for as long as possible. That sentence, those sentences can obviously be, be translated as, I'm just lazy. Um, I just don't, I don't, don't want to stretch myself. I don't want to do the effort and, and invest the effort to make learning part of my life, life strategy. So where do we then go with this? <clears throat> the above scenario that we have just figured out and, 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 and presented the above scenarios of I stay with a trend or I at a point stagnate or I just fall behind all the time further and further. The above scenarios are applicable to a country as a collective, a business, a family and an individual. Results, the results are exactly the same for all. Poverty, failure and death. Now, dear delegates, I want to just explain this a bit. If a country doesn't invest in the learning institutions of that country, they cannot invest too much. They can stop all their military investments and everything that they do on the sideline and invest in the schooling and the college and university uh, institutions of the country. If they don't do it, they fall behind in the world of development and eventually the, the gap makes them an unsustainable entity where, where nobody wants to invest because they're not skilled people and I can carry on with that. But for a business, <clears throat> we are currently in the midst, well, in the first third, I assume, anticipate, of the fourth industrial revolution. It's a huge thing for business. It's a huge issue. The fourth industrial revolution drives businesses to be what they called hyper successful in their ventures and in the, in the way they provide their customers with services and, and products and, 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 and sustainable growth. That is, it's an intellectual thing. It's something, it, there are people behind the scenes working 24-7 to make everything smart, smooth, quick, automated, and sophisticated. Now, if you are in opposition to those companies who work relentlessly to grow their knowledge base about their industry and their products, you fall behind and eventually the market kills your business. So if a business stops learning, they are in big trouble. And it's a collective thing. There must be a culture in the business that we continuously grow our knowledge and skills base collectively. Everybody must learn. 
Then on an individual level, um, I have very, very, very horrible news. And that is, as we stop learning, the brain shrinks. The, neuron con the neural connections in the brain becomes passive. They, they disconnect from one another. We start to forget everything. We start to, uh, to forget how to do the basics in life. The brain deteriorates. And at a point, the brain becomes dysfunctional and the person cannot sustain their own lives. And eventually it leads to death. The only thing that we must do to try, and, and it's, it's the only uh, um, remedy that we have to prevent the deterioration of the brain is to, to push the brain beyond its comfort zone every day. We must, it's like the muscles of the, of the, of the body. We must push the brain beyond its comfort levels to remember, to work, to understand, to create, to innovate, and, and to be active beyond its functional uh, uh, comfort zone in order to keep it healthy. So which countries in the world, uh, which countries lead the world? Those with well-informed and qualified governments, there are just a few, and learning institutions that harness the power of knowledge and skills. They are the leaders. They lead the world. Which companies lead the world? Those who know, innovate, study, and develop their collective learning faculties to stay on top of their game. They must invest in the knowledge and the skills development of their people so that their people can take the business to the next level and outsmart their oppositions. Then they become business leaders. Who has the best chance of a long and healthy life? Fact, healthy aging is a function of learning and forcing the brain to perform outside its comfort zone. Don't scale down. Remember these words. Please, don't scale down if you become older. Scale up. Don't retire. Refire is the sentence now. You must Keep your brain active if you want to prevent an, a collapse of your mental health and your brain neuron structures when you become a little bit older. Keep the brain active. It's a sustainability, a sustainable strategy for life. Now the catch. How do we learn optimally? Um, we must allow our habits to, um, to guide our learning, and, and, and these are the reasons. Our habits are based on embedded existing patterns of behavior in the brain. Rather use them. It's much easier to use existing patterns than building new ones. If I have the habit of problem solving, I learn problem solving skills and capabilities much easier than what I have to learn at other uh, uh, learning content where I have to create new patterns in the brain. So to strengthen the, path, the existing patterns in the brain is as effective as creating new ones and creating new ones obviously is as effective as growing and developing existing ones. It is much more fulfilling to learn things that are in line with your habits. It's just, this is not rocket science. It's just so much more fun to learn things that are in line with your existing profile of habits uh, and, 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 and use the current structures that are strong in your, in, your, in your neurons and in your habits to add additional functions to those structures. Your learning method must also be in alignment with your habits. Now, this is, this again, this is so simple, it's actually uh, not even necessary to mention it, because it is easier to use existing neural paths than, to, than creating new ones. We must use our existing habits to determine our optimal way of learning and development and creating additional faculties of skills and knowledge in the brain. Your shadow match study methods report and your career report inform you about these directives. If you read your study methods report that shadow match generates based on your habits, it will tell you immediately, this is the method 
that of learning that fits your habits best. Your career report tells you these are the topics that is best for your career and that those topics relate to your habits. So those topics indicate areas where you can start with an easy learning path into the future and develop yourself in this way. And as a collective, obviously in the business. Last session of slides. This is what we call the 60% red line. I'll explain it. 60% knowledge and skill threshold. The minimum level of knowledge and skills required to be successful in a job, a task, or an assignment. How do we reach this point? Some people never reach this level. What is the most effective way? Now, the information to follow is quite in, uh, interesting, but it's also critical, especially if you are in the learning and development of people, especially if you are interested in the in coaching, learning, development of people, but, but especially also for uh, parents with children. And I will mention that, but we have webinars about that in future coming, and we already had a few. Let me just explain this again. If I appoint somebody, they, let's say the Shadow Match team decides to appoint somebody new as a customer support individual. The person must reach a 30% knowledge and skills level before the individual can, in a competent way, work with the system. And this is applicable to almost all jobs. Almost, we, we, it's, a, it's a minimum criteria for, for being capable of doing something successfully. So if I am a medical doctor, I need to be, I, I need to remember 60% of the stuff that I have learned in order to be a competent medical doctor. If, and I, I can carry on with the examples, but that's the, what they call the red line minimum threshold of knowledge and skills. You must have a 60% capability in terms of remembering the stuff that you have learned and also um, doing the things successfully as a skill. So now, how do we learn these things? By self-reading. In other words, I take a book and I read it. On average, I have to read it 10 times before the knowledge that I have gained to a permanent level is enough for me to do the job or to do or to execute or to put this into practice. So I have to read the material mindfully 10 times. So that is self-reading. So I take a book, I have to read it 10 times. Then it doesn't mean that I can do it, but I know how it must be done. So let's take a simple example, how to remove and, 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 and put back the engine of a car. And I read a book, just read a book. It's a reading material, no pictures. Got to read it 10 times. Then I can attempt to do it. Listen to a lecturer. I have to listen to the lecturer eight times. After that, this is on average. Remember now slide number one, we said these are the, the uncomfortable things. They are resistance to learning, da, 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 da. Listen to a lecturer. I have to listen to a lecturer on average. Remember there are people that can listen to a lecturer once and they've got it, but, but there are people that must listen to a lecturer 30 times and then they still don't have it. So on average, listening to a lecturer eight times, we can expect the person to got it. This person, they've got it now. They, 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 they have a good knowledge framework to work with it. Watch some somebody doing something six times. If I watch somebody doing something and I've watched him or her six times do it, I should be able to do it. I've done work um, many years ago. I consulted in the leather industry, uh, leather manufacturing and leather designs and blah, 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 blah. So what, what, I, what I tested was 
if I give somebody a book to read and then make a leather jacket, how many times do, the, do they have to read the book? In some instances, they never got it. Um, then if we give them a lecture, how long does it take? And this has been mapped all over the world with lots of research. But when you show somebody, let me show you how to make this jacket. Stand here around the table. I'm going to make a jacket. Watch closely what I do. If once I've made six jackets that they have watched, they should be able to do it. They should be. It's not necessary. Some will be able to do it after number three, maybe four. Some will show me again, show me again, show me again. 10 times, but on average, they should be able to make the jacket and to, to, to do what I've done after six sessions of making a jacket. Then if I watch somebody do it, and then I'm doing it as per the example. So this is how you do it now. We go, I'm going to teach you how to make a leather jacket. So you take the leather, put it out, Put the pattern on the leather, start with the big ones, cut it out like this, cut, all right, do it. Then they do it. Um, and then next step, uh, we then cut the next pattern out, the next shape, the arm or the whatever it might be. Okay, this is how you do it. This is how you lay it out. This is how you prevent the leather from, from, from stretching and pulling into buckles. So this is how we do it. All right, go do it. So I watch, and I do whilst I'm in the process with the teacher. I need three sessions on average, and then I'm capable, I should be capable of doing it. But watch this one, dear delegates. This is the magic moment for us all. There's a method where you need it once or maybe twice, and you've got it. But this is the tricky one. This is the very tricky one. Figure it out yourself. Then plan and plot the solution that you have figured out. Execute your plan and solution successfully. If you do it once, you've got it. So how do we do it now? I give somebody a leather jacket. I say to the person, you've got to make one like that. There's the leather, there's the sewing machine, there's the inner, there's this, there's this, there's that. Make it. Figure it out. I don't care how. I don't care how long it takes. Figure it out and then make it. And the, if the moment the person delivered one successful jacket, they've got it. So now what we do, dear delegates, is we send people on a course to listen to a lecturer and we expect them to know what they must do. We have wasted our time. I'm sorry for all the training uh, institutions. The retention of knowledge is extremely, extremely low. Or we ask people to read a book and then they must know. As parents, we are even even worse, we, we say to the children, read, go listen to your teacher. What we must do is we must allow our children to figure out the things themselves. And sometimes we say, but I just want to help them. We're not helping them. In fact, we destroy their learning faculties because they never learn. We, we do not allow them to self-learn. We, we parent them, we mother them, and eventually they can't learn anymore because they haven't been through this process of struggle. You've got to struggle with it. You've got to figure it out. You've got to plot your plan and then make the jacket. And if it doesn't work, make it again. And the moment you have successfully delivered the jacket or whatever it is you have learned, and the knowledge is almost permanent. It's fixed in the brain. This is how we learn, dear delegates. 
This is how nature teaches us. If a child needs to learn how to walk, this is how they learn to walk. You can, if you want to ride a bicycle, this is how you learn to ride a bicycle. You do not ride, learn to ride a bicycle by reading a book or by listening to a lecturer or even by watching some, well, this can help you. This might help you. It could help you a bit. If you ride with somebody, hold on to that somebody and then leave the somebody so that you stay stable, hold on to them again, leave them again, hold on to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much quicker. It's much quicker. But this is how you ride a bicycle. You give the child a bicycle with outside wheels and you say, figure it out, my, my boy or my girl. And it might cost a little bit of material crim and, 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 and plasters, but this is how we learn. Then you have learned, you have taught the person how learning works. And the problem that we have is we want to help people. We don't help them. We actually hold them back. We must, helping people means that we must help, we must allow them to figure out themselves. I want to end and then tell you a story and then I'm open to questions. This is how the Shadow Match PDPs work, dear delegates. Shadow Match has got personal development programs in it. This is exactly how they work. They say to the, to the person in development, go to your work and find three unsolved problems. Bring them to me. I'm your coach. Okay, these are three unsolved problems. All right, figure out what is the solution to these problems. Oh, I don't know. Okay, but figure it out. Go, I'll see you in two weeks' time. Two weeks' time, come back. Oh, I figured out. I think these are the solutions. Okay, present the solutions to your manager. All right, present. Get signed off for one of those solutions. This is how people learn. If I take the problem and I solve it, who has learned? I have learned. My, my, my student has learned nothing. With that, thank you very much. But I want to stop by telling you a story. In my second year at university, I got a professor in Greek. Now, Greek is probably said to be one of the toughest university uh, subjects all over the world. And if you want to become a minister, you've got to have, in my case, in the church where I was a minister, I had to have Greek too. So second year Greek. So I passed Greek one flying cum laude. Second year, first lecture, I said, this is Neil. Second lecture, I lost the lecturer, completely lost. Him. I can even tell you what his name is, but I won't because they are well known in the circles where I move. I completely lost the lecturer and I said to myself, myself, this is going to be a challenge, but next week um, I'm going to ask him. So the next week I came into the lecture room, I am lost out of it, gone. So as a good student, very dedicated to my studies, I waited for the lecture to, to pass and uh, I waited for the, for, the, for the professor at the door and I said to him, professor, can I come and see you sometime during the week? He said to me, what's your name, sir? I said, um, I'm Peter de Villiers. He said, what do you want, Mr. de Villiers? I said, Professor, I really struggle with this. I don't get this part of the subject. I don't get it. He said, and? He said, um, I said to him, I want to come and see you so that you can explain it to me again. He said, no, Mr. de Villiers, there's something that you do not understand. I understand the subject. I said, no, 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 I know that, Professor, but I don't. He said, but whose problem is that? That's your problem. It's not my problem. He said, if you want me to explain it again, come back next year, almost the same date, same lecture room, probably the same time. I'll explain it again. Between now and then, it's not my problem. It's your problem. If you want to pass the exam, you've got to know these things. Good night, Mr. De Villiers. Goodbye. I was, I was done. I I wanted to go to the, to the Department of Education about this guy. I thought he was the most horrible person in life. He taught me the lesson of my life. He wouldn't have helped me. I went back and I said to myself, I'm going to Von Skyx tomorrow morning and I bought, bought a book. I'll never forget the book, Richie. 
The author is Ricci, Basics of the Greek Language. And I got the topic in Ricci. And I studied it for about a week, day and night. And the next week, I understood the problem and I passed the exam. We do not teach people by telling them. We teach people by helping them to struggle it out themselves. And if we don't do that, we waste our time. So we need to create a culture of learning. With that, thank you very much. Back to Lizette. I'm here for questions. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for another insightful um, presentation and discussion. There were a few questions. I will position them. I think some of them have been answered, but maybe you want to just also comment on them. The first question that came in um, was, what is meant by learning um, as a definition? And does it exclude or include certain platforms? For example, um, if you look at if you watch YouTube channels, is that learning or is it just experience that you need to to go through for learning? So I guess um, the answer is that learning is broad and it includes everything an individual does to um, to learn something new, like you can do a language course on YouTube and that's learning. So that was the first question. Um, the second question related to that is what percentage of a day or a month or a week or whatever um, is healthy to dedicate to learning and could spending too much time on learning actually be counterproductive? Um, and then the last question from the same individual was, if learning is not counterproductive. Thanks. That's the questions for now. And then we'll continue. Uh, Lizette, these are good questions. Uh, learning is the process of acquiring additional capabilities as knowledge and, and motor uh, uh, um, abilities. Motor abilities are the physical ones and knowledge are the, the, the conceptual or the, the information base. So learning is the process of acquiring these faculties of abilities, knowing things and being able to do things. Um, the, the challenge is that the brain learns much quicker if we do things than when we just learn or, or, or hear it or see it. So if the, the physical part of our bodies feed the brain with much more information about a topic or an, or a, or, or an exercise or a task than what we can feed the brain one if we only read or, or listen to a lecturer or a storyteller. Um, so it's the process, learning is the process of acquiring motor, physical and, and, and knowledge um, uh, capabilities and information. Then it, it seems like we need to stretch our brain an hour a day, minimum. That's the minimum. Can we do too much? Uh-uh, uh-uh, can't do too much. Um, you can't. It's, you cannot overstretch and overexercise the brain. The brain is a, a, an extremely competent machine. You cannot overdo it. But one hour a day, stretching the brain for one hour a day. Now, dear delegates, what I just want to share with you, you can have a look at the work that Professor Jepson has done in the United States. Just balancing exercises, for instance, st stand on one leg for, uh, with your eyes closed. If you stand on one leg with your eyes closed, the brain has to give 10,000 instructions per second to the body to keep you upright. It is the toughest job that you can do uh, brain-wise. brain, brain -wise. It is extremely tough. But if you throw a ball uh, against the wall and catch it with the other hand, in that process, about 30,000 uh, um, algorithms run through the brain uh, per second to, to do it. So these are simple things that we can do to help keep the brain fit, but we must, uh, Jepson, uh, J-E-P-S-O-N, Professor Jepson, he did balancing, you will see him, he's about 75 years old, riding on a skateboard through, um, through the cities in, in, in New York and Los Angeles and so on, where he lectures and he presents his work on Alzheimer and on dementia and, 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 and all those, those horrible diseases. Um, so uh, can I overlearn and um, can some of the learning be of no value? Uh -uh, no. Any learning for the brain is like medicine. It helps the brain to create substances that is necessary for the connections between the neurons. 
It keeps the neurons isolated from one another through exercise and staying fit. Because what happens is the neuron uh, isolation between the cells become very thin. And then uh, we get these confusions of, of, of memory and we can remember certain things and then we mix it up with other things. So what happens is a typical example of, of the neurons in the brain that has lost connection, uh, um, their isolation so that they are isolated from one another. I will start calling my son, uh, whose name is Jaco, I will call him Chris or Andre. Um, because what happens is the information is not isolated and, and, and then we have these disconnections in the, in the neurons of the brain. So we must keep it healthy by one hour a day, stretch it, and we can't overstretch and overdo it. And if the brain, but obviously the optimal uh, learning is when we take the knowledge into practice. So if I, if I do something physical with the knowledge that I have acquired, I've answered that, let's say. Thanks, Peter. There was one last question. Um, then I'll open the floor for, for live questions. Um, is there an ideal combination of, of these elements? I guess it refers to theoretical knowledge. It, it refers to reading the book, listening to a lecturer, those elements that you had on, on, on that graph, um, and obviously watching somebody and then actually doing it yourself. Is there an ideal combination ultimately aiming at giving a person an opportunity to figure it out? but training and guiding for a controlled environment, such as pharmaceuticals and medicine. So obviously some of these skills you can only acquire when you have a base knowledge of the theory and what is the ideal combination? Thanks. Yeah, Lizette, if we read a book, we must tell what we have read to somebody else uh, because that is, that is putting the reading material into action. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying send the book to somebody. I must tell the person. This is what I read in this book. This is so interesting. And then an, another thing is if we want to take it to the next level, we must actually do some of the things that the book has teached us or uh, some of the content of the book must go into the practical side of my life so that my physical activities teach my brain in correlation with the book. But we can combine these things in a very healthy way. We read a book, tell the content, share the content with somebody, tell people at a braai or when we go to watch rugby about the book and this is what they say and this is what they say and this is what is, because then in that uh, way, we actually take the book into the practical side of our lives. And then um, some of the areas are extremely dangerous. Obviously, if you teach somebody to fly an aircraft, uh, you can't tell them there's the aircraft, figure out how it flies, and then see if you can land it. And if they've smashed 10 airplanes, you say, cool, you've got it. Uh, but what, what you do is you take the person with an instructor and they do exactly what the instructor does. And they, they keep on doing it over and over and over and over. And in, in, in some instances, some people never get it right. But, 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 but we need to find a combination of these things. I want to refer back to video watching. It's an extremely efficient way of learning. It's not the best. Remember, it's not the one on the, on, on, on the very far left of my slide that where I said, this is the one. Figure it out. Plot your, your, your solution. Try to make it. And once you deliver it successfully, cool, you got it. But watching a video is probably one of the most successful ways of teaching people. But we must remember, we have to watch the video over and over and then try to do what the person in the video tells us. Let me give you an example. If I want to play a specific golf shot um, and I watch a video, I must take the video on my phone or my tablet to the driving range, put it in front of me, Watch what the person does and try to do it. I say, okay, don't get it right. Watch again, try to do it. Watch again, try to do it. I mustn't watch the video just for the sake of watching a video. If I watch the video, I must try and take the information that I've gathered from this picture or this video and execute it in my own life because that's where the permanent learning actually takes place. It's a very efficient way of learning. Thanks, Peter. Um, dear participants, what I will do now is I'm going to stop the recording and then I will enable the setting for you to ask your questions live. We are done with the formality. So if you need to run, 
Um, up to now, the recording will be available. If you're curious about the questions, then maybe you can stay on a bit longer. So allow me to stop the recording and thank you very much for everyone who attended.